morning. Um, we've assembled a group of world experts to uh, discuss a very novel and uh, evolving sort of both operation and technological, technological aspect of uh, cardiac surgery. We have Dr. Sam Balke, Dr. Eric Glare, Dr. Johannes Bonatti, and uh, Dr. Mike Halkos, and I'm Pavanat Luri. And uh, we would like to spend the next 15 minutes talking to you about robotic coronary surgery. Um, I thought I would start by sort of setting the stage for the local politics, as we know, as Tip O'Neill said, all politics are local. And as cardiac surgeons, I think that all our practices are driven by the local practice patterns of our cardiologists. And I thought we'd just take a few minutes to just sort of set the stage sort of for our, the way our referral bases are set currently for minimally invasive coronary surgery. Um, and Sam, maybe you can start with the, the basic feelings of your cardiologist at your institution. Yeah, so I'm at the University of Chicago Medicine. Um, been there for the last four years. And since I've arrived there, I've had a very, very strong um, uh, enthusiasm and support from my interventionalists uh, regarding um, total endoscopic coronary bypass. Um, and uh, they're very aggressive cardiologists and I was kind of a little worried initially because they do a lot of CTOs and they do a lot of multivessel stenting, but I think that really complements what we do. And uh, we're, we're able to kind of look at all the caths that we get together, customize not only the patient but the coronary and do a lot of hybrid revascular. Great. Eric? So I'm at Swedish Heart and Vascular Institute in Seattle, and uh, it's uh, a large institution, but um, private practice by and large. Um, I've been there now for six years, and it's, I think, very important to develop, as Sam was saying, a heart team, um, very much like we do for structural heart, where we're looking at cather cats together, um, anything that's a little bit more complex, um, where we sit down and decide what the, the best plan for each patient is. Johannes? I work at the Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. Uh, we are a governmental um, entity in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. And uh, I work uh, in a heart and vascular institute. Uh, we have uh, set up our hybrid program in a way that it was, it is a new hospital and we integrated a hybrid program from scratch uh, into our work. How is it at, at Emory? So at uh, Emory, uh, it, as you said, it definitely necessitates a change in culture with how we treat coronary disease patients. But what we've accomplished uh, much in that heart team type concept is our cardiologists believe very strongly in the Lima to the LAD bypass graft. That's where they feel our value is most. And so most patients with complex proximal LAD disease get a minimally invasive, which is a robotic assisted Lima LAD graft and those with less complex multivessel disease also get a minimally invasive Lima LAD graft uh, in a hybrid approach. They'll stent the non-LAD vessels. Yeah, at the University of Pennsylvania where I am, I think it is, it's been much more of a push to try to get the cardiologists on board. Several years of, of really working on talking to them about the quality of the Lima LAD, which they believe in, so that we had an easy buy-in on isolated Lima LED disease, but often it was very much driven by instant restenosis, sure. complex LED disease. And then the big area that we finally started making, um, having growth in, which is really exploding for us, is the hybrid piece. Mm -hmm. they, the, I don't think, I've been having a really hard time getting them to back away from multivessel PCI but they're very e it's very easy to talk them into a hybrid procedure for a traditional coronary bypass patient. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess it kind of gets back down to the economics. Sure. Well, I, I think it starts that way. You know, the, the first patient is the one that would otherwise have traditional bypass surgery, yeah. but with time, you will find that they will back away more and more from the proximal LAD, uh, and then even in single vessel disease patients, once you've proven uh, what can be accomplished with minimally invasive approaches for Lima LED grafting, uh, then they'll start, those come next. They kind of come last. Uh, but you know, you, you sort of work through that in your development. Any indications for uh, hybrids uh, come from surgeons who see a patient with multivessel disease, they refer for open cabbage, and then they, they go back to the cardiologist and say, listen, can you do 
the right and the circle, mm -hmm. people with Lima 2D LED, I think that's a very common pattern still. Yeah, yeah. it still seems to be very surgically driven. It is, initially, initially it's surgically driven. Yeah. I see. I, I find that I refer more patients to the cardiologist than they refer to me. <laughs> is the way it works. Yeah. And what happens is the patients find us, and uh, they're looking for, uh, you know, a, a non-sternotomy approach to their multivessel disease many times, and we end up giving the cardiologist, you know, the right coronary or the distal circ marginal, and and many times we're doing actually two memories. So we're doing more than just a, a simple hybrid, but a complex or an advanced hybrid um, with bilateral IMAs. I think that's a very important point is that um, we can provide a sternal sparing procedure to revascularize their coronary arteries with multivessel arterial revascularization, um, which you know, may have some long-term benefits for the patients. Absolutely. If I may step into that, um, I was involved in the uh, uh, NIH trial on uh, observational trial on, on, on hybrids. And uh, what we saw is that uh, if you screen a coronary disease uh, population, uh, if you can do Lima to the LAD and uh, combine that with stenting, approximately 15% would be suited for uh, a hybrid uh, coronary intervention. If we can do double IMA, this uh, percentage is pushed into pushed the 40-50% yeah. range. So that so makes it so important that we as surgeons can uh, provide double IMA in less invasive or yeah. totally endoscopic yeah. robotic fashion. So, you know, for us, the and I agree with you, the being able to add an additional graft, especially to the left side, I think is, is crucial. But for us, the majority of our hybrid population, 60, 70 percent, is, it's really more two-vessel. You know, yeah. it's usually yeah. prox LED or complicated LED proximally plus a right, most commonly the right. Yeah. Uh, the right also being the, the, the target that you would least likely to put another arterial graft to. Um, so it works out and, you know, again, the two-vessel disease patient tends to be a lower syntax, something most ag inter aggressive interventional cardiologists would try to tackle themselves. So when you're starting, um, you know, you have to be able to prove the quality of your results, uh, lower complication rates, potentially lower stroke rates that are comparable to PCI because you're av av avoiding uh, the aorta and bypass potentially. And the reintervention rates, which and you know we, we, we like talking rates. about the 30 days um, outcomes, sure. mortality and stroke, but the other piece that keeps getting lost in all the coronary data, which is always there, but we never focus on, is the reintervention, right? It's, right. It, it's even though they're not undergoing redo heart surgery, it's still a redo intervention that carries risk with it. Right. Sure, but we have to deal with the question of reintervention. If we do hybrids, we become interventional cardiologists as well. We indicate uh, PCI. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, we have to live with the fact that there will be re-interventions on the PCI part, uh, yeah. which you need to tell the, uh, the patient. But I think uh, one important principle that we are following in, in hybrids is that we, are, we avoid vein grafts. And uh, has been shown in many studies. I mean, the, the, the occlusion rate of a vein graft is up to 20, 30 percent in the first year, and that's way more than the restenosis rate that we found in stand. the last generation drug eluting stents. That's a that's a that's a great point, and you know that actually brings us to a trial which I know many of you were involved in the design of, which is the upcoming NIH um, trial. Which I know at our institution we have a lot of enthusiasm, and I get the sure. sense that there's a lot of enthusiasm, and. Uh, for the viewers, the trial itself is comparing multivessel PCI versus a hybrid procedure. So this is actually a trial that will pull from a traditionally interventional population. So it will be correct. very interesting to see how that changes perception over the course of that trial. What's the enthusiasm at, you know, at your institutions for this trial? It's, it's very high, and I think the design is such that it's relatively large. There's over 2,000 patients that are to be randomized. The primary endpoint is at five years uh, to include repeat reinterventions. Uh, so I think we'll learn a lot uh, from this approach. The uh, another thing I wanted to touch upon, and Sam, you touched upon this, which was um, the future of TCAB. And you know, I think we we all know several people that within our own. Um, Maybe not in Abu Dhabi, but within Philadelphia, Atlanta, Chicago, Seattle, 
where people are doing minimally invasive coronary surgery. It's really a robotic assisted um, procedure. TCAB, I think, um, has been a little bit more slow on the uptake. And some of it, my sense is, is limited by technology. Um, what is your sense on the future state, um, maybe you, Hannes, and Sam, in terms of the anastomotic devices, um, and just the coronary vascular, you know, coronary anastomotic options that are out there? Well, I'll go first. Um, uh, my take on it is that anastomotic devices are important and are necessary uh, for the development of a, of a robust um, uh, TCAB, multivessel TCAB practice, beating heart. Um, we're not there yet. Um, you know, those of us who have kind of waded into that pool have, have tried to make it work and, and with a lot of success, uh, albeit I don't think that uh, the adoption rate has, has uh, been uh, good enough yet. Um, so I think there's a lot of development to be had. Um, I think Johannes uh, can speak to, uh, you know, the non-anastomotic device world of TCAB and, and, and he's trained a lot of people to do that as well. Uh, I think we have a lot of work to do. Um, I don't think the, the procedure is necessarily not going to develop, um, but I think we have a lot of work to do for it to become um, a, a little bit more adopted. And you know, Johannes, you've done a wonderful job of, with that operation of actually doing a traditional operation through a tiny hole and basically it's essentially a hand-sewn anastomosis mm -hmm. with the robot. Is that an operation, or you're an expert, is that an operation you think you can teach to a large group of surgeons to actually be able to manage the disease? Yeah. No, I don't really think I can teach it. I have taught it to, <laughs> I think it's seven or eight people in the world who, <laughs> who have, uh, under my guidance, uh, done TCAPs. We have shared parts of the procedure many times. They went out and did the procedure uh, themselves, so that's not, not the real issue. Anastomotic uh, sewing is one part of the procedure and uh, Sam has shown nicely how well you can do that with a connector. I believe you should still be able to sew uh, hand or robotically sewn as well because uh, if the connector doesn't work you need the skill set uh, to do that. Um, if, if I compare it to a robotic mitral valve surgery for example, I would say that doing a lima to the LED as a TCAP has a, a level of difficulty probably comparable to a, a robotic mitral. You want to think it's harder? You know, I, the, the harder thing Mike is... Mike and I do the robotic No, no, no really. So. And, 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 and I tell you, uh, Dr. Lehrer and I, the fastest TCAP that we did at the University of Maryland was two hours. We are not, wow. uh, not in the times when, uh, when it took six, seven hours. Far away from that. And the difficulties are more in getting oriented in the chest. Okay. You, you have to drive from north to south and up and down. That is one of the difficulties. Once you have a good exposure of the target vessel, the sewing itself uh, is, I wouldn't call it straightforward, but when we, if you have the skill set uh, engraved in your brain and your hands, then yeah. Eric, you want to comment on that? Yeah, it, we I work mean, together. This is just like any other surgical procedure that we learn. Um, when we learn how to do coronary bypass grafting as residents, we do hundreds of operations before we feel that we're capable of going out into the world and doing this procedure on our own. Um, the, the skill set um, is similar principles when we sew by hand or sew by robot as when we do through an open sternotomy, but it does require some additional skills, some additional ways of thinking, and an organization of the actual surgical procedure. Um, and that can be simulated very nicely, and um, can, you can learn this um, through a stepwise iterative approach. But if I may say, Pavan, I, I think we shouldn't really get hung up on the TCAB or or the uh, robotic mid-cab, if you want to call it that. I think the sternal sparing approach to coronary bypass is really what we need to focus on and talking about these hybrids. And what Eric mentioned before, if we can leverage two mammaries um, on a routine basis without opening the sternum, I think that we've gone a really long way towards achieving that goal. If I may step into that one, and but that's exactly what works so much better with a robotic device, harvesting the right IMA. Uh, with conventional thoracoscopy or, th or direct vision. It is feasible in slim patients. I, I know some people are doing that, but the technology is so valuable specifically for harvesting uh, both IMAs. I think that the, you know, this is a highly select group of experts that can do these things. And we're trying to promote new approaches to surgical revascularization to the more general cardiac surgical community 
you have to do this iterative stepwise approach. And you know, the first step is getting comfortable with the robot, if that's your choice, or mid-cab, or endoscopic approaches. And then the second key uh, skill set that is necessary to master is a Lima LED anastomosis perfectly uh, through a smaller incisions. And so those sound pretty basic, but for people that aren't doing that at all, they're, they're definitely hurdles. And you know, that's where it'd be nice to see that push, because in most instances, the greatest value that we bring to the table, I've, I'm a big fan of multi-arterial grafting, especially to left-sided targets, but the greatest value we bring to the table in the eyes of our cardiology colleagues is the Lima LED graft that supplies blood to 50% of the left ventricle, the LED. And we should probably start there. That's a great point. With that, um, I want to get final thoughts. Um, and the final thought I'd like each of you to think about is what do you see, where do you see the future of coronary surgery like 10 years from now? We'll start with Sam. <laughs> <laughs> um, where do I see the future? I think that, um, I think eventually we're going to be doing more hybrid revascularization because I think it brings together the best of the both worlds. You know, we have a lot of great advances in, in drug eluting stents and those are only getting better. You know, the pipeline is, is from here to uh, who knows where. Um, and, but at the same time, I think the, the value of an arterial graft to the left coronary system is, is indisputable, and uh, cardiologists agree that, uh, that a Lima LED is, is the lifeline. So I think we're gonna be doing more of what this, as Mike said, select group does already, and, and that might uh, pervade uh, you know, out to the, to the rest of the surgical uh, and, and um, coronary community. Now, I, I think the recent trials have really shown that coronary artery bypass grafting is durable, that it's important, and it's here to stay. And as it is here to stay, as we move forward in the next few years, um, technology will help us um, as it develops to perform this procedure through smaller incisions, which clearly benefits the patients. And I would agree with both of you and everything that we've been talking about for the last 15 minutes. I've got a very optimistic view on coronary surgery. And I actually see hybrid is continuing to grow. And Sam, as you said, the technology is continuing to drive improvements in PCI technology. Um, but I think the value of the Lima LED is just so huge. I would also think that uh, coronary surgery is here to stay. Treat invasive treatment of coronary artery disease will not be taken over purely by uh, catheter-based intervention. But we have to be open to catheter intervention as we do in, in, in hybrids. I agree with uh, our colleagues' uh, statements that uh, uh, we have to move towards less invasive approaches. I think we should set our goal at uh, providing a completely endoscopic approach, just like laparoscopy did. We have to combine our brains and skill sets and work on a procedure of the 21st century. And uh, I uh, would also think when it comes to hybrid that uh, we should also work on getting these procedures done simultaneously in a hybrid OR. Yeah, I'm optimistic as well. You know, who would have thought 10 years ago we'd be more worried about surgical aortic valve replacement than coronaries? And, and in fact, <laughs> yeah. as Eric said, the trials have been pretty uh, supportive of, of coronary bypass surgery. I suspect that hybrid procedures for multi-vessel disease patients will probably hit 20 to 25 percent, which is a lot. Uh, I think there will always be very uh, severe complex disease that needs traditional sternotomy bypass surgery. So I don't think uh, our group is supporting or suggesting that that's not going to exist. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to capture, keep that population that's getting sternotomy bypass stable, but provide patients with minimally invasive options for Lima LED grafting instead of PCI to the proximal LED. And I think that's where the future is. Thank you for your time. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation.